Hey there, welcome back to Short Takes 331. Today we're going to talk about the Green's function for the diffusion operator in 1D, and this is going to be part one. We're going to talk about an application and a few more aspects of the formalism next time in part two. So recall that we've talked about the homogeneous problem in recent videos where we solved this equation, where now I put everything on the left-hand side, this is our diffusion equation, with some given initial condition, which is set by this profile here, f of x comma zero, where zero is of course time and t equals zero, and, and we have boundaries at plus or minus infinity. And what we try to figure out is how this initial profile evolves in time and in space. And that's how we uh, solve this problem. And we used the Fourier transform to solve that problem. And we did that in a couple of different ways. What we want to tackle today is the inhomogeneous problem where we have some given inhomogeneity j of x comma t driving the system. So this is usually a given function and, and our job is to solve for f given our initial conditions, our boundaries, and also this uh, function j of x t. So uh, in, a, in, in simple form, and you may recall this from uh, videos from uh, quite a few videos ago, what we have is a problem uh, that w where we have a uh, linear operator d applied to a function f, and that has to be equal to another function j. And so in our case, our operator d is the diffusion operator, which takes this form, just one time derivative and two spatial derivatives. And we want to put d on the other side of the equation. In other words, we want to find f, which is equal to d inverse applies to, applied to j. The d inverse that we're looking for then, or it, the, its application to j, will take this form, which is usually called the convolution, where we have our Green's function or kernel of the operator, uh, not to be confused with the null space of the operator, which we also call the kernel often. So I'll just refer to this as the Green's function, which has these four variables, x, t, and x prime, t prime. And the role of this x prime, t prime, t prime is to pick up the information from the source, uh, j of x prime, t prime. And once this is integrated over x prime, t prime, then that variable disappears and we're left with just x and t. And, uh, uh, and, and this will give us the solution under certain conditions. And the main condition is this one here, this equation. So the d applied to g is delta of x minus x prime delta of t minus t prime. And you can see that this works because if I apply uh, d to f here, the d goes right through the integrals. It's applied to g of x comma t. So it's applied to the x t variables, not the x prime t prime, which are integration variables. So it's applied to x to the x and t part. And, uh, and if that is replaced then by a, a delta of x minus x prime and t minus t prime, then the integral becomes trivial and we right away recover j. So once again, d f immediately recovers j if the Green's function g obeys this equation in the green rectangle. So uh, our job then is to find g that has this property. And uh, we're going to use the completeness relation of Fourier modes to represent the delta of x minus x prime and delta of t minus t prime. In this way, this is something we saw in previous videos as well on the Dirac delta. The delta of x minus x prime is given basically by the Fourier transform of one uh, evaluated at x minus x prime. And the same we can do with t minus t prime. And because it's conventional, to do so, I'm going to use a minus sign here in the uh, uh, Fourier transform as opposed to the one with the plus sign here. Both are the same, they're equally valid for this, uh, for this purpose. And uh, so here I have t minus t prime and t minus t prime in the exponent as well, integrated over a variable omega instead of k. Again, it's this convention when we talk about time versus space. So the next step is to propose a Fourier decomposition for g. Uh, again, it's a Fourier decomposition in x minus x prime and t minus t prime, and we have our uh, our main object of interest here at this g tilde of k omega. Uh, if you uh, propose this form, uh, the composition in Fourier modes of g x t x prime t prime, then when you apply the operator d to both sides of the equation, then you will bring down from the exponent a minus i omega from the temporal part and a k squared from the, um, from the spatial part. There's an i k and i k, so it's actually minus k squared, but we already have a minus sign in our operator, and so that brings you, that gives you this plus sign over here. Uh, now that uh, d applied to g is by definition our Dirac delta of x minus x prime and t minus t prime. We use, like I was saying, the Fourier decomposition for these two uh, objects, these two Dirac deltas, and so that gives you this double integral over here uh, as a representation of the product of these two deltas. Now, if these two generalized Fourier transforms over space and time over k and omega have to be equal to each other, then it must be that this whole factor here has to be equal to one over two pi squared. And that's what you see here in this uh, green rectangle, that g tilde of k omega is one over two pi squared times minus i omega plus k squared, the whole thing to the minus one. 
And then our job then finally to arrive at the G of X T X prime two prime. So in space and time coordinates is then to do this uh, uh, Fourier transform, or if you want inverse Fourier transform, do the integral that defines our Fourier decomposition, where we're now for G tilde, we've inserted what we just found here in this green rectangle. Now, how do we do this integral? We have an integral over k and omega. We have to do it. How do we carry it out? In this situation and in very uh, and very much in, in other similar circumstances, for example, with the wave equation in other cases, the first thing you want to do is the integral over omega. And what you notice when you try to do that is that we, you will have to generalize the integral, or perhaps one way to think about this is that you need to generalize this integral over omega to an integral over uh, a complex omega, so an integral in the complex plane. And um, that is a way to actually define this, uh, what we mean by this integral, and that will define the initial conditions that this G satisfies. Because if you notice here, if this is G and this is all there is, then where are our initial conditions? They're nowhere to be found. And this is something that we'll have to answer in the next video in more detail. But for now, let's see what this integral does for us. And so uh, if we do first the integral over omega, we notice that this uh, factor minus i omega plus k squared, which appears in the integral, has a pole, has a simple pole at omega equal to minus k, i k squared. What does that mean? It means that that's where it blows up. If I set omega equal to minus i k squared, you'll see that I get minus k squared plus k squared. That cancels out, and so we get a zero in the denominator, and that blows up. And why a simple pole? Uh, because there's a minus one here. If it were minus two or, or higher power, then it would be a multiple pole, like a double pole or a triple pole, and so on. And so the integral that we want to do, then, if we consider this as an integral in the complex plane, is what's called a contour integral. That's the what we say in complex analysis. We want to do a, a contour integral where the integration goes from minus infinity to infinity on this real line. And um, and here in the complex plane, we have the real part of omega and the imaginary part of omega. And this is where the pole sits that we just described at omega equal to minus i k squared down here where this red cross is. So um, if we want to do this integral, we're going to, uh, in this case, define it as an integral where we co close the contour either around the, the bottom and enclosing this pole or around the top and enclosing no poles at all. And, uh, and then we take that uh, enclosing um, semicircle to infinity. And, uh, and using the theorems of complex analysis, we can then uh, obtain our result. What we want to make sure is that when we close that contour over the top or, or around the bottom, is that those um, upper or lower integration regions go to zero, uh, when, or not the integration regions themselves, but their contributions, when we take that, those contours to infinity and to, to really cover the whole real axis, so then they don't contribute to the final result that we really want. Uh, for, for our application. And so we're going to do, again, we're going to do this integral over omega in the complex plane. We're going to close the contour in a proper way. And notice this factor here, this is very important, is e to the minus i omega t minus 2 prime. And so if, if t is less than t prime, what we need to do is uh, we're going to have this factor be negative. And so this omega, uh, we're going to close it around the top. So if we close around the top of the complex plane, close the contour in this way, then we're going to have a positive imaginary part. So th this means that uh, we're going to have a plus i times something positive. And so with this minus i, it's going to turn into a, a, a positive exponential here. But t is less than t prime, and so this part is negative. And so that contour will, or the contribution from that contour will be exponentially decaying as we take the limit of this contour being pushed out to infinity to cover the whole real line here. And so, and so that contribution will disappear. And that's exactly what we want. And so for t less than t prime, we're going to close the contour around the top half. We have no other choice. And so that will give us that uh, we enclose no contributions from anything. And so uh, and the top part of the contour goes to zero. And so we're left with the uh, realization that this integral over the real line, over the whole real line in this way, is actually zero. The so-called residue theorem of complex analysis tells us that when you do a closed integral like this and you enclose no singularities of the function, no poles, then there's no contribution and, uh, and, and the integral is zero. And we already know that the top goes to zero, and so it means that the integral over the line is zero. And, uh, and, and there's a physical interpretation of that. If we do that, then what this is telling us is that nothing happens before a signal is picked up. So this uh, Green's function, which connects what happens from the source to the, uh, to the result that we want to find, to our function f. Remember, this connects our, uh, our function j. Let me go back up. So this connects our function j to our result f. 
from x prime to x, it does it makes that connection. If nothing happens for t less than t prime, it means that we're not picking up any information until something happens. So <clears throat> we're we're not going to pick up any information from the future. We're picking up information from the past and propagating it to the future. And that's why if t is less than t prime, then uh, then the, our Green's function does not propagate any information, and that is just zero. So uh, uh, if, if we worked, if this were non-zero, then we'd be picking up information from the future and propagating it to the past. That's not what we want. Uh, we, uh, we want uh, an application, or rather we want a result that respects causality. And so that's what we call here retarded Green's function. Now, there are applications where you may want the advanced Green's function, in which case you would have to do something different. Uh, but in this case, for t less than t prime, then we close the contour in this, in this way and, uh, and we propagate the result towards the future. And, um, in the case for t uh, greater or equal to t prime, then we do the opposite. We close the contour around the bottom half, and that's exactly what you would expect that this expression uh, is telling you. This minus i omega t minus t prime. If t is greater than t prime, then you have to close the contour around the bottom half because this will be positive, and you want an exponent here that is negative so that uh, this uh, closing the contour in this way will send this, this uh, semicircle uh, to zero exponentially fast as you take the limit of, uh, of this semicircle being pushed out to, uh, to infinity away from, uh, away from this contour where then our result will, our full result given by, by the integral around the closed loop <clears throat> will simply consist of the integral over the real line. Um, by the residue theorem, we can calculate the result coming from just this pole here that we already identified. And so using uh, the, the, the theorems of complex analysis, uh, using contour integration and the residue theorem, we obtain this final form, which is very similar to something you've already seen if you saw the previous videos on diffusion. So then we have that g of x t, x prime t prime, is basically a Fourier transform in x minus x prime of this, um, of this diffusion factor e to the minus k squared t minus t prime. Again, very similar to something you've already seen in previous videos. Uh, we can simplify this expression by defining some notation, delta x, x minus x prime, delta t is t minus t prime. And, uh, and complete the square to this integral. It's a Gaussian integral over k, as we've seen in previous videos, once again. And if you do all that, you carry that out, you will find that our, then our g of x t, x prime t prime, is simply this prefactor, 1 over 2 pi, square root of pi over t minus t prime, and then this Gaussian factor, e to the minus x minus x prime quantity squared, divided by 4 t minus t prime. So this is, of course, very similar to a result you saw before in previous videos, where we didn't have any right-hand side at all, and we only had uh, some non-trivial initial condition, but this, this uh, Gaussian type behavior is typical of diffusion processes, uh, and you see it here as well. So this is the result for t greater or equal to t prime. Remember, we said that for t less than t prime, the result is zero. And so to encode all that in a single equation, we define this form for the final answer. So then the final answer is g of x t x prime t prime equal to a heavy side theta function, which is zero if t is less than t prime, and one if t is greater or equal to t prime, times the factor that we found before uh, that is up here in this, in this green rectangle. So that's it. That's uh, 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 our, our final answer for our Green's function, our retarded Green's function for this application and uh, for this diffusion equation. We'll actually see a concrete application next time. Uh, and I will show you some plots of what this does to, uh, uh, to, to the solution given a source, given something that's driving the system uh, uh, but we should ask, what happens to the initial condition? f of x comma zero, it's nowhere to be found in this solution here. So how, do we, uh, how can we be sure that our solution obeys this initial condition? Well, we don't have the full answer here. This is the full answer for the Green's function, but it's not the full answer to our problem. So we'll say that uh, next time, and so, uh, uh, so stay tuned. Uh, as always, if uh, uh, you enjoy these videos, uh, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. And if you're looking for a tutor in physics or math, in English or in Spanish, you can contact me at shorttakes3031 at gmail.com, or you can leave a comment in the comment section below, and I will get back to you. And I'll see you next time.